I want to uh, begin by acknowledging uh, some individuals who have contributed to uh, helping this event uh, uh, be the success that I think I feel it is, and I'm getting feedback that I think a lot of people share that sentiment. Um, I want to thank Chris Schultz and Karen uh, Dunnison from the Penn State Conference and Institutes who helped with all the logistics for bringing us together. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kevin Conaway and his uh, team from the uh, Penn State Public Broadcasting, some of whom are here tonight, uh, who helped, you know, get this, uh, get this event down uh, in, in, uh, in technology for all of us to enjoy. Uh, that's right. That's it. That's it. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, Yang Xingang, um, doctoral student, and Armand, uh, who um, contributed in more ways than you know, um, helping with the bios, helping with the reading of drafts, uh, making contributions many months ago um, towards helping this process. Jennifer Glasgow, uh, my assistant uh, administrator in the College of Education. Uh, Tom Kiter and Joe Myers, who you met, uh, who did the, uh, the films. Uh, Tom, along with Nancy Tawana, with Carla Zembozal, and Greg Kelly, were part of my leadership team, um, who I met with periodically to bounce ideas off of and got really good feedback in coming back as to how to help pull this uh, event together so they, they share in the, um, in, in the, um, you know, the success of this program because they contributed to it successfully and a lot. And finally, and all of you know this, is that the, the one person who really, really, you know, contributed uh, a lot to this whole process was, was Amber, Amber Bismack. So let's acknowledge Amber. So as I was going off to NSF, uh, David and my uh, department chair, Carla, said, um, you're going to need some help. And uh, naive as I was thinking that I could climb any mountain on my own, um, I said, OK, I think that'd be a great idea. And, and Amber, it's been great to work with you. And she, she and I have forged, uh, I think, a nice working relationship and an intellectual relationship as well. And, uh, she had a heavy hand in helping with the uh, with the white paper um, that that went together. So um, on the topic of the white paper, um, another set of thanks to uh, Jim Greeno and uh, Drew Jatomer, who uh, met with me on a uh, very interesting weekend in January in Pittsburgh, in which um, we showed up on a Thursday and were slammed by a snowstorm on a Friday. So so much so that. Um, Drew got out of town at about 11 o'clock at night. I had to spend the night on uh, uh, Friday night um, because uh, the planes weren't going anywhere. And it was crazy that Pittsburgh, a place that you know you would think you know could handle the snow, but uh, no, it happened at two o'clock and three o'clock, and uh, everyone got out of town before the snow plows could get to the streets. And when that happens, there were just a lot of accidents everywhere, and no one got out of town. Uh, it's a pleasure to, um, to meet uh, tonight, and I'd like to introduce uh, Nicholas Jones, who is our new provost here at Penn State University. And um, so, <laughs> newly arrived from Johns Hopkins University and um, with a background in engineering. Is that right? Yeah, good. And Dean Monk, of course, thank you for your support in all these efforts. So there were a lot of personal stories today. It was interesting. People would start out with their stories. And let me start off with one that uh, I've thought about for a long time and have never shared this uh, with anyone. So this is a, a first. My grandfather was born in 1890. Um, and um, when I was 18 years old, approximately, um, he was uh, close to the end of his life. And I had an opportunity to spend a an afternoon with him, and I said, gosh, you went through it all. I said, the car, the light, the radio, the television, airplanes, space flight, you know, just, I mean, I just, I, I was just absolutely amazed that I, I knew this man who had, had gone through this whole process, and he, I said, 
how did you deal with this? What, what, do, you, what do you make of it? And um, he, said, he said, well, you know, everyone knows how to find shortcuts. <laughs> everyone knows how to find new paths. And, um, you know, when you, when you reflect on that, one of the things that it says is that because of the science and technology and engineering and the communication sciences and the medical sciences that were all part of that particular period of our advancement, industrial innovations and mass transportation, telecommunications, on and on and on and on, we, we have to, you know, it's a sobering fact that science is a moving target. We'll, any approximations of the conceptual knowledge is never going to be stable. Any conceptualization of the practices is never going to be stable. And our ideas of epistemic processes are going to change. They're going to be reworked. And so those are some of the challenges that we face as we think about this thing called STEM education. And whether, as Rose said, it's you know STEM, S-T-E-M, with math as a tool, or S-T-E-M with S-T-E as a setting for the math, we still have to work out this kind of you know, interdisciplinary approach to what's taking place. So we've talked about on-ramps. Where do we start? Where are the best places to get into this game of next generation science standards built around three pillars, three frameworks, cross-cutting concepts, practices, science and engineering practices, uh, core ideas. We've talked about trading zones. We've talked about kernels of ideas. We've talked about ethics and coupling of eth ethics and epistemic ideas. We've talked about seeing the surprises and in, in, in what goes on in the classroom and learning. We've talked about professional development, which is sustainable and scalable. And Tom Litzinger got us off at the beginning by helping us understand that these systems occur at so many different levels. And indeed, I think we move away from that as understanding that whatever number of levels that we thought about, um, they're even more complex than that. Uh, Gene, you got us thinking about knowledge building and brought us back to sort of the core idea. Well, why would we make the move to this three-pillared framework? And it was um, you know, kind of the idea that Gene and then Jonathan talked about about, well, really what we want to have is, is kids, you know, knowing how and why we do what we do and not necessarily just the what. You know, why do we believe what we believe and why do we believe it in the face of alternatives? Put your stake in the ground. Take a position. Tell me why you believe that, why you want to defend that. We talked about trust and criticism. Trust in the sense that when people it gets so overcomplicated, the ideas, as we were talking about climate change, the uncertainty in data, the inability to come to terms with what that is. And uh, Leona said, well, we end up just saying, well, I'll trust the people or the voice of the community that we have. And we know that that leads us into a lot of uh, troubling spaces because different people trust different voices and different perspectives. And that sort of Embold makes us more emboldening to think about the fact that what we need to do is more important in terms of reaching out to the next generation and to teachers. We talked about the importance of criticism and the ability to communicate and criticism when Jonathan was referencing Michael Ford's work. And, um, and I was, uh, at that point in time, I was trying to grab for the mic and grab for the mic as we all were over the past couple of days. Because what I wanted to say is that the roots of that criticism that building of that criticism resided in the conversation we were having about quantitative reasoning. As it begins with kindergartners and first graders and second graders who can begin to add, tell you an awful lot about a fair test or is that a good measurement or not. And so when they learn to ask questions about the data and the measurements themselves, that's really the starting path for building up towards the ideas of criticism. So we talked about quantitative reasoning and measurement, and Tony and Rich took us into that space, and so did Heather. And then we talked a lot about common language. And, um, and I was fascinated by Jim Minstrel's take on this, because his argument was that what we really need to do is we need to listen more carefully to the language that our students are using 
because that should become the basis upon which we conduct our assessments. Now that resonates for me well because one of the things that I think is a strong cornerstone of our understanding of learning and the learning sciences is that um, learning occurs best when there's a situation in which there's very effective mediation of that learning. So an individual can only go so far on his or herself, but there needs to be an intelligent peer, an intelligent tutor, an intelligent teacher who knows how to listen to what it is, making thinking visible is the label we put it towards the assessments and the tasks that we wanna give children so that we can make that next move. So we talked an awful lot about meaningful engagement. And, and that leads to the idea of affordances, which is something that I think a lot about. Over the years, I've come to the conclusion that for a long, long, long time, we've asked, what do we want students to know? And what do they need to do to know it? And I've, and I've stood that on its head. And I think that's where we are now when we talk about practices. And those practices are both cognitive in nature, they're material in nature. Um, what is it that we want students to do? And what do they need to know to do it? And when you just switch that around, it creates a very different learning environment in which we have to plan and sequence the instruction. And so Jim Greeno gave us some insights about, you know, one of the ways forward is perhaps as a coordinated research agenda is to think about a set of productive kernels or germ cells um, that sort of get us on these productive pathways. And that when I started to, you know, I had a, I had a, I was conceptualizing this talk over the, you know, the past couple of days and I thought I had it nailed and then Paul gave his talk. And I said, okay, <laughs> uh, I gotta go back and revisit uh, a little bit of the thinking. But I would ask you now, because I'll say that I think that one of the ways that we can apply some of what Paul was saying about network improvement communities is that if we were to begin to identify some of these kernels, some of these germ cells, and we were to begin to develop teams or networks around those germ cells, and we were to take up some of the issues that he talked about as he identified as the themes of the conference so far at that point was recognizing the importance of systems, the importance of measurement, the importance of variability, and the importance of context. If we began to use those four areas and looked at these kernels and germ cells and started to study them in the way that the network improvement community and improvement science was talking about, it represents, I think, a different way for us to think about conducting our research and aligning our research teams. Um, Leona told us at the end of, uh, on Thursday, is that what we have with the next generation science standards, and there wasn't, you know, they, they took a good beating over the past couple of days. Brian, you know, had a shot or two at there, and Leona said it's, you know, it's a, it's a flat, undifferentiated list, and, and Nancy, one of your uh, postdocs, I don't think he's here with us tonight, but that was the first question on the first day, out of the first time, he said, well, what nodes are the most important nodes? And that kept coming back about, you know, well, what's the priority? What would you start with? And that's exactly what Leona said about, you know, there's a foreground background issue here. What's the pros and cons of starting with this or starting with that? We don't know the answers to those yet. And we don't, we, we don't know the answers to that yet. So we have, um, you know, with the, the word psychometricians came up a lot. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, everyone's, there's everyone's, you know, sort of, you know, a whipping horse. But I've been, I've been doing a lot of reading over the years, and one of the things that um, I remember from taking science to school is that, and Jean and Leona, uh, part of that process, was that you, know, you, you have to have the evidentiary base to make the claims in these National Research Council reports. And I remember that one of the things we settled on was, well, we might not have the strong evidence, but man, these are really good bets. These are best bets. Well, that's Bayesian thinking. That's Bayesian thinking. That's not starting off with equal priorities on your, you know, this isn't a control against some treatment in which, hey, I don't know which is which. And I think that that was kind of the, I think the 
the reaction that I think came out um, at part of this conference is, we know a lot already. We've got a lot of prior probabilities of events that we know, understand, and what the conditions are. And we need to build from those. And it's not starting off with a, a controlled treatment against something else that has something to do. So, um, Rich, uh, you'll remember that you and I were uh, down at the Department of Education several years ago, and uh, we were locked in this kind of, you know, debate about the frequentists who wanted to have the control and, you know, they just wanted to have that racehorse, right? You know, this against that, this against that. And, 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 and I've, I don't think anyone ever put it better, Rich, when you set out and you said, you know, we want this stuff to do some theoretical work. You know, it, it can't just be starting off with yet another ground zero point. Is, you know, we, we understand some things and we should be building from the point at which we're there. So that's a reminder that, you know, that we can do that. Uh, research around failure. Uh, Bill Carlson brought it up when he was distinguishing between what are some of the differences between science and engineering. And in engineering, failure is actually the test. You take a system to failure, and then you understand, you know, where it can go and what it can do. Um, you know, Bill Penuel also talked about the need for us to begin to think about failure in a different way and that is to look at the productive failure. You know, how do we arrive at that? And that sort of ties to what we sort of heard uh, Paul talk about at the end of the day today, is that, you know, failure's not bad if you learn from it. Failure's bad if you don't learn from it. And so the rapid iterations that Paul was talking about, you know, and I, I conceptualize them as kind of six-week cycles. And so what's it going to look like if we start to look at these kernels and we start to move them through a six-week cycle? And we start to get that part of the cycle right, and then we say, what's the next one? And we have an iterative process around the next cycle, and we start building out these sequences or ideas about coherence over time. So in the appendix that uh, Drew and Jim contributed to, which laid out some of our challenges, um, big challenges. Um, Drew writes about observational protocols. You know, th this is huge. This is huge in terms of the accountability system that we're in right now in the broader system about what counts as good teaching. And um, I'd like to read this one paragraph from something that Drew wrote there. Interesting, interestingly, studies of protocols have shown us that observers have a difficult time making consistent judgments about certain aspects of classrooms, particularly those things associated with instruction. While psychometricians talk about this in terms of poor rate or reliability, what this really represents is a lack of common understanding of what it means to teach and learn content. To engage in meaningful questioning and feedback and to support students' reasoning and problem solving, Thus, the use of these protocols not only can tell us something about teaching, but they can reveal the broader challenge of establishing common understanding and language about concepts such as those described in the framework. So he goes on to talk about these kinds of things as um, thinking about expanding common expectations and indicators, so that assessments can be indicators, but not all indicators can be assessments. And so how do we articulate and monitor student progression on these more abstract constructs, referring to the science practices, referring to the cross-cutting concepts within the framework? Before addressing that question, we should get clarity on why we would want to add these things to the assessment menu, which I think is the question that was raised over the last couple of days, is that we, is this, you know, the bridge too far? And as Jim Pellegrino, uh, not Jim Pellegrino, Jim Greeno, talked about was, you know, I, I loved it, Jim, when you said, you know, first I was an experimental psychologist, then I was a um, cognitive psychologist, and then I was a cognitive scientist, and then I was a learning scientist, and I've never changed, is, uh, is, is what he said. But that's how, that represents how the field started to label him. Um, but, uh, but, you know, but, but Jim uh, takes up uh, in some of his 
ideas about coherence as the research goals is that you know we really don't understand coherence as we need to and in particular Jim takes specific issue about the cross-cutting ideas as they're proposed in the frameworks in the appendix and that um, they should be productive uh, project for someone he says he says but if I'm right there's a reason to be dubious about this version of the cross-cutting ideas and what he's getting at there is that there's a kind of a shallowness that is represented by them being applicable to all the disciplines when the scientists themselves deal with these things in very specific ways. So that domain general and domain specific tension uh, sits with us constantly. So I said to Stephanie after the second day, I said, do you think it's by accident that everyone's bringing up these issues about funding mechanisms? <laughs> <laughs> I just out of curiosity. So I th Hilda was the first one who brought it up, and then uh, and about the problem of three years of funding. And so I would be remiss in not sharing a little bit with this audience about what's going on at NSF and down in Washington at this point in time. Let me start by saying that I've had, I've had fair success over my career in getting NSF grants. But one of the most important grants that I got at a time was, and it was interesting, Kirsten, because you referenced it in your paper, and it was the grant we had with SILT, uh, the Center for Innovation and Learning Technologies which was this interesting center that was uh, bringing together lots of newbies in the sense of trying to think about learning technologies in the area. And what they did is they made $20,000 grants available to anyone who wanted them. That was it, that was the max, absolute max. And out of that grant, I got together with Susan Goldman, I got together with Susan Williams, I got Kirsten as a graduate student, Carrie Zhao, who went on to study with Brian Reiser. And we did some really amazing study that looked at um, the way in which uh, Knowledge Forum, um, and, uh, Marie Scardamalia's and uh, uh, Carl Bereiter's work on CECL, that then became Knowledge Forum, was a platform for s stimulating uh, the work. And I realized that you know good research can be done um, with limited funds if you have bring together the right team. I'm learning at NSF that sustained funding over long periods of time is not easy. And those who learn to play the game know how to go across the boundary between the public funding zones and the private foundation zones. It is my perception right now that more and more the private foundations in the United States are starting to become more keenly aware of and willing to engage in um, the kind of research that, that you are doing. Um, I am finished, I just finished one project that I helped put together between Spencer Foundation and the National Science Foundation, where we had a two day meeting and looking at persistence in mathematics. I'm working with my colleague Dennis Schatz, where in September we'll have a two day meeting with the Wellcome Trust in, uh, in London and also with the, um, the Moore Foundation and with the, um, and with the Noyce Foundation to begin to look at how to further a research agenda around informal science education. It's not impossible, uh, but one of the things also that I learned when I was in England was that the private foundations can go places that the public federal foundations cannot. They're willing to take the risks and to go places, but the thing you have to learn is that the private foundations are kind of niche foundations. They do this, but not that. And so cobbling it together is important. Barbara Means came to NSF to report out on the report that was uh, Digital Technology in Education, which was a year-long report that the Department of Education put together because superintendents and state educators, chief state officers wanted to know what should we be doing with technology? What's the game in technology? Please give us a report that's gonna help us make some of these important decisions. 
And what she started off by talking about was the difference between how federal grants play out from the Department of Education, or NSF, in a long, protracted, first you do the pilot study, then you get the grant to do the efficacy study, then you get the grant to do the scale up, and seven, eight years go by. And then she said in an industry, they say we can't wait that long even for the review process. Why would we want to submit a proposal? It's going to take you six months to even decide whether or not we're going to get funding because what we want is just to get into the game. All we need is 3,000, 5,000 people. If we have 3,500 people embraced in a learning environment, we can begin to study learning. And so we have this new emerging field of learning analytics. It's big data. It's looking at the different kinds of areas. And NSF is frustrated in this regard because at we, we can't be in that game. We're not that flexible. We, 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 can, we can't, you know, uh, be a process of that. But what we can do is we can be part of the establishment of, you know, looking at the criteria that are used uh, for establishing, you know, this whole big thing about MOOCs and about online learning and the ways in which very quick kinds of studies that take place. I'm, um, I have a concern that one of the things that seems to be happening, in my opinion, as I look at this, is that, and it was, it was interesting, because this was a, a struggle and a debate that we had in taking science to school, was that learning which occurs by an individual or with a dyad, and that learning which occurs among a group. And we're, we've, I think we're finding with the introduction of a lot of this technology, is that we're being pushed away from the social nature of learning back towards the dyad and the interaction of one-on-one -on -one and, and getting periods of this around the individual learners. So those are some of the challenges that we have there, but I think that we have to be prepared for a very different learning environment that came up when we think about how much of what occurs outside schools, that porous boundary, between schools, blended learning, cross-venue learning. And um, at NSF, we're trying to stabilize, in one sense, what's going on in the directorate of EHR. I know that some of you have some, uh, some dogs in the race for the recent proposals for ECR, the EHR core research. And, um, and that's an exciting new development for us because it's saying that we're going to try and stabilize directions around four areas, learning, learning environments, broadening participation, and workforce. And that we want to try and begin to have, you know, those things remain so that if you're working in one or more of those areas, you can count on the fact that it's going to be there. I'm excited about that because what that opens up for me is an opportunity for us, that's one way that we want to become more like the other directorates, the disciplinary directorates. And when I was mentioning this at lunch today to some people, that when you look at the statistics for early career awards between EHR and all the other directorates, it's like an order of magnitude. And we're not investing in our young folk, and I think that that came up in the conference as well, is what are the young people going to do? What are the problems that they're going to have? And I think if we can begin to increase the number of awards that are given in two of our programs, which we're, we're not doing a lot in EHR, and I've spoken with my leadership, and, and they are already aware of the fact that this is a direction that I'd like to see my division go, is to have an increased number of career awards and an increased number of research experiences for undergraduates in the learning sciences, and not just in the disciplinary sciences itself. And so we, um, you'll be seeing in the next weeks that come ahead all of new, new solicitations being written from um, both DO and from uh, DRL. Um, it's, uh, you know, we're waiting to see, you know, what the rainfall is going to be around the Coast Dem reorganization. But uh, I can tell you that within uh, NSF itself, uh, we're beholding just to ourselves, we can go forward with our own ideas without having to worry about what others are saying. And I'll finish on a note and just saying, um, one of my jobs as a division director is to always say, if you want to come to NSF, give me a call. 
we're always constantly receiving uh, uh, Vitas, and I'm pleased to say that in the next two months, the following individuals will be joining us. Julie Johnson, who is a colleague of uh, Kirsten's at the Science Museum of Minnesota. Uh, Evan Haidt, who is a cognitive psychologist from the University of California, Merced. Michael Ford from the University of Pittsburgh, one of, one of uh, Leona's PhD students. And we're very excited to welcome Chris Hoadley to NSF um, in, um, at the end in November. We're excited about Chris coming because one of the new developments is that we're, um, we're if you looked at the, uh, the 2014 budget proposal, you'll see that we're establishing a new program which is called STEM-C the C standing for computing partnerships, and we're merging the MSP program from DRL with the CE, Computer Education 21, 21st Century, from the size program. So two directorates are coming together to form this, uh, this new program, which will transition. It'll take a year to get our act together, and then in another two years, we hope to have some really further strong directions with emphases around engineering, geosciences, pre-service teacher education, and um, computational thinking, and computer science writ galore. So thanks for a great couple of days, and uh, really looking forward to um, how we can take this forward. And uh, I know that you guys can figure it out.